you. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming here on your Friday evening. I promise it will be worth it. Um, my name is Tanya Lubis, and I am an assistant professor in the College of Education right here at Eastern Oregon University, but my role tonight is the director of the Center for Culturally Responsive Practices and the Oregon Teacher Pathway Program. Uh, before I continue any further, this presentation is brought to you in part by funding from the Oregon Department of Education and our partnership with Intermountain ESD. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is our third event with these two wonderful people, and it's my pleasure to introduce you all to them tonight. And then um, they will lead you in some discussion um, for the next hour, and afterward, please help yourself to the refreshments outside. There are plenty, and we would like you to partake in them. So um, I, I will introduce first uh, Dr. Francisco Rios, who's down here. <laughs> And uh, he is a professor of secondary education at Western Washington University. He is a distinguished figure in multicultural education and is taught in a variety of educational settings. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin and worked at California State University San Marcos and the University of Wyoming before arriving in Washington. He also served as dean of the Woodring College of Education at Western Washington University, but he decided he liked teaching a lot better. <laughs> He, his research interests include teachers of color, Latinos in education, and pre-service teacher education with a multicultural focus. Dr. Rios also has served as a senior associate editor of the Multicultural Perspectives Journal, which is the journal of the National Association of Multicultural Education, where he also is a past president. Aside from working in the field of education, Dr. Rios has written numerous scholarly articles and books and received many awards. So welcome, Dr. Rios. Our primary speaker this evening is my good friend. <laughs> Dr. Rios is also my good friend, but I, I tend to befriend uh, Kristen's in my life. So this is Dr. Kristen French, who is an associate professor in elementary education and director of the Center for Education, Equity, and Diversity at Western Washington University. She graduated from Western Washington University with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a minor in Native American studies and elementary education. She completed her master's at the University of Mass Amherst in bilingual ESL and multicultural education and a PhD in language literacy and culture also from the University of Massachusetts. She taught in an urban magnet Montessori school in Massachusetts and returned to Western Washington after 21 year absence to join the College of Education. Her engaged scholarship includes multicultural teacher education, indigenous education, decolonizing theory, and critical performance, performative pedagogy. She is well known for exceptional work in language literacy and culture, specifically in indigenous education. And at Western Washington, she focuses on putting the theory of social justice into practice by offering rich opportunities for students to engage in community work and focus on issues of equity. She's received numerous awards and recognition for her work, including an Excellence in Teaching Award. She has multiple publications and presentations, and we're delighted to have them both join us here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rios and Dr. French. When Tanya does introductions, it makes us sound so good. Oh my goodness, um, that's not the only reason we keep coming back. Um, thank you so much for having us, and I'm very excited tonight to talk with you about tribal sovereignty, indigenous futurities, and the intersections of multicultural education um, and water, land, place, and space. So um, I do wanna just say that we have a couple other guest speakers. Well, they're not really speaking. Um, we have other guests here today. We have some Salal. Um, I brought Salal. Salal will probably get its own special reward for being here tonight. Maybe some water. It's been in the car, a little hot. Um, and also some Camas and Kinnikinik. And these are three indigenous plants to this area and also the area that we're coming from. So we brought them as kind of guest speakers with us tonight. And for those of you who have, um, who are registered to come join us tomorrow to do some hands-on work, you'll get to know these folks a little bit better. Um, and they're amazing. All right. 
So I wanted to just begin um, by letting you know a little bit more about um, myself and the community that I come from. Um, I'm, a, I'm Scott Bipakuni um, from the Blackfeet Nation in Browning, Montana. That's where my family's from. And I wanted to really ground this work in land, water, place, and space. So um, you'll see um, the photograph up here is a picture of my mom and my cute little son who's got the cranky face. Um, he's 13 now and he still has a cranky face. Um, no, he's super cute. He did uh, some of the artwork that I'll show you in here, um, some of our plant artwork that we're doing. And this is my family in um, Browning, Montana. We have a celebration every year called Indian Days, um, North American Indian Days, and it's a powwow and rodeo. And it happens at the time when we had our Ocon, which was a spiritual gathering um, that happened around the 4th of July every year. Um, and we're at the parade at this point. So over here are more of my family members, and I, I really love this picture because um, I use a lot of the curriculum for them from the National Museum of the American Indian, and we all were there on the opening of that museum, which was such a big deal. And so I hope uh, if you ever have a chance to go to the museum in Washington, D.C., that you do go. Um, any, has anyone been there? Oh, great. Okay, the cafeteria is the best in the whole wide world. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, if I have time, I'll share with you why. It's fantastic. Um, you can eat indigenous foods from all over the country. It's incredible. Um, I also wanted to share with you a little bit about um, our land. And this is uh, Chief Mountain, Inestico, which is one of our greatest teachers in our community. And you'll see here the buffalo, the ini. Uh, we Blackfeet folks um, really... Uh, grounded what we did in our food sources and in our ways of knowing and being with the buffalo. And over here is um, some of my favorites, berries. And last time I was here, we talked about uh, what would it be like to be a berry, to be so generous and to be so giving and sweet and all these wonderful things. Um, and so part of the work that I find really inspiring is the food sovereignty and decolonizing work. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how I've been inspired by that as well. But some of the things that are going on in our community um, are around protecting sacred lands from um, oil um, and fracking. And also we have a water compact which really uh, supports water water rights because water is sacred. And uh, so I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. And then to talk with you a little bit about, I'm in, we talked a little bit in Francisco's presentation earlier today about the importance of humility and all of us are learners as we grow. And I'm still coming to know who I am as an indigenous person. And um, this, I wanted to share with you a little bit about my Eastern Band Cherokee background, which I didn't grow up knowing a whole lot about because I grew up being mostly um, identifying as Blackfeet and Grovon. Grovon is a community a little east of um, Browning, Montana. But my grandfather, my great-grandfather was, and grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather was um, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, the Eastern Band Cherokee. And my mom really wanted to go before she passed to go to um, North Carolina to um, get to know our family members that are still there. Well, she didn't get a chance to, um, but I had this opportunity when going to the National um, Association for Multicultural Ed Conference this year to, well, you know, I thought Memphis doesn't seem too far from the Smoky Mountains. On a map, it's like this. It's a little farther than that, um, but we made it. So with my colleague, Jeanette Haynes Ryder, who's also a Cherokee um, educational researcher, we, um, we drove to Cherokee, North Carolina, and we had a place-based experience. So it was really an incredible journey to be able to, to, to be in place and learn about my history um, and the history of removal, and also the history of the connection to land. And one of the, uh, it turns out that at the museum, this lovely lady turns out to be a, a cousin of mine. Uh, and she was able to take us throughout the museum. So we did some of the research, but we also went out on the land. And this spot right here is um, the site of my great, great, great grandfather. So you see me right there next to this gentleman. He was my great, great grandfather. And he was the first uh, elected 
chief of the Cherokee Nation, Eastern Band Cherokee. Um, and this was his father's land. And for those of you who know a little bit about um, the history of removal or the Trail of Tears, um, my family were the folks that stayed, but also they called it the um, Cherokee Underground Railroad. So my um, great-great-grandfather was one of the folks who tried to keep Cherokee on the land by feeding them and, and housing them and helping to hide them up into the mountains. Um, so I got to learn a lot about that history, which was incredible. So um, I'm also still coming to know who I am as an Amskapi Pukuni and also my relation to other Blackfoot people. So um, just, just in February, my daughter Elizabeth, who's in this photo and right here, she's, the, the, she's a much longer arms than me. So our selfies, it's Elizabeth. Um, my daughter is an organic farmer and she started her own farm this year and she calls it the Long Hearing Farm which is my Blackfeet great-great-grandmother's name. So she's trying to, she's using heirloom vegetables from Eastern Band Cherokee and also some indigenous vegetables on her mainstream farm, her organic farm. So she's trying to bring back indigenous foods to the area and also some of our historical indigenous foods on her farm. So we had the opportunity to go to Alberta, um, Standoff, Alberta in February. Not probably the smartest idea, um, we got stuck there in snow, but it was absolutely incredible. So we went for a conference on food sovereignty, and it was part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. So um, my family is Blackfeet from Montana, but there are three bands of Blackfeet, and the Canadian border crossed us. So now we're four, because the Pikuni split in two, the Blackfeet in Montana, and then um, the Pikuni who are just above the border in Alberta. And then two others, the Kaina, which are called the Bloods, and also Siksika, which are farther north in Alberta. But together we make the Blackfoot Confederacy. So this was a food sovereignty conference that was speci specifically for the Blackfoot Confederacy, and it was incredible. I had never been to a conference before where all of the presenters were Blackfoot. And they were all scholars and all doing great food justice work. And 90% of all of the people in the audience were also Blackfoot. So it was such an incredible experience to be talking about land, water, place, and space in community in ways that are healing and, and scholarly. So I, this photograph over here is my mentor, um, Mike Brewsthead, who is a tribal leader and incredible, um, who is one of the people who started the KIPA project, which is the Kaina Environmental Protection Association. And we're with um, a young woman who is an internet star, an Instagram star. Um, she is, um, she, her name is, oh my gosh, Gladstone. Um, I'll come, I'll, I'll remember in a moment what the first name is. But she does food sovereignty cooking. And so she has this, um, this website called um, Indigi Kitchen. So if you're interested in that, I say go check her out. She's really cool. So on our trip there, we happened to come the first day of um, uh, Mike Bruce had said, hey, can you come to the college? This is Lethbridge University. We have the first ever native chancellor being um, inaugurated on that particular day. So I was able to be there to see this happen. I think it's the first chancellor, native chancellor, in any of the Canadian universities. So it's a very big deal. And he happens to be Blackfoot. So we're here, here there too. And so Elizabeth and I, the, you saw the photograph that's on the website for um, uh, Inestico, the um, chief mountain, which is so sacred to us. Well, it was foggy the whole time we were there. And we're driving from Alberta into Montana to visit my family in Browning. And then just suddenly the fog clears right when we get up to the mountain. And so we were able to take this picture. It was absolutely incredible. And then we went and had a yummy dinner. This is my family in, um, on the reservation, uh, and they're just lovely. So I wanted to share with you that this work that um, we're talking about today is not abstract. It is um, in our everyday lived experiences. And it's also a process. Those of us who were were products of um, historical trauma, um, whether that's boarding schools or um, you know being relocated or displaced. 
which is or some of the things we'll talk a little bit about today, um, we're, we're coming to know and we're coming back to our land, water, place, and space. And I'm a big part of that process too. So that's me in a water, land, place, space nutshell. And um, my hope for today for all of us, and, and this, I'm going to engage you in some questions, is first of all, we have to start with gratitude because everything is better when we start with gratitude. It just changes the tone of all we do, and it really grounds our work. Um, I want to come back full circle with you, with Francisco. We've, as Francisco shared, we've been here. This is our third visit, and we love it, and we love Tanya and the team. It's been incredible. And we've, it's pushed our thinking every time we come back here. We, we talk with the, the team about what is it that you want? What is important for folks at EOU? And, um, and it just inspires us to, to, to go further with our work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to engage with land and territory acknowledgments because they're really sexy right now. And so we're going to break those down. And what does that mean in multicultural education, but also what does that mean for you here at EOU? And then we're going to talk a little bit more about tribal sovereignty and local land-based pedagogy and what that will look like and what hopefully that will look like for all of you. Um, we're going to ground our acknowledgement, the EOU acknowledgement, in um, indigenous futurities. And then finally, hopefully, we're going to work towards um, cultivating solidarity with one another and also the communities that are in your area. So why, Kristen, are we starting with gratitude? Why be grateful? So I'm starting with Western science. So Western science has shown us, and this is some recent research, and my buddy at the University of Washington, is um, his scholarship is on hope, and he does um, uh, education um, psych, and he has put together some really great resources. So he, one, of the, um, one of the main studies talks about gratitude and perceived stress and burnout with firefighters in Korea. And what they found with this particular research by doing gratitude, that the perceived stress went way down. And that the burnout actually went way down. So we know that gratitude has physiological um, effects in highly stressful situations. Also, when using gratitude um, to promote positive change, um, research has shown that it in increases your well-being, so just being grateful will increase your well-being. It also increases happiness and life satisfaction, and it has um, positive effects on life, and it also decreases symptoms of depression. Good stuff, right? All right. And then finally, the last um, study is about doing um, a weekly gratitude. So if you, if you take time to do weekly gratitude work, um, it will increase positive emotions, and it will also increase social trust. So great reasons to focus on gratitude. And then coming back to where we were two years ago, um, we, we shared with you allegiance to gratitude. And when we were here last, we talked about cultures of gratitude, also our cultures of reciprocity. And we went through the entire Haudenosaunee address. And part of the Haudenosaunee address, um, uh, Francisco shared earlier today, and it's been translated into 40 different languages. And the Haudenosaunee have said, please, please use this and share it. Otherwise, um, people won't know. And how can it work if we don't share this Haudenosaunee address? Which is giving gratitude for our natural world in such a beautiful way. So tonight, we're not going to go through the Haudenosaunee address, but I certainly hope that you, um, you look for it and that you engage with it as well. So one of the things about gratitude and being raised on gratitude from um, allegiance to gratitude from Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Kimmerer, is she talks about what, it would, what would it be like for us to be raised on gratitude and give allegiance to gratitude rather than to political declarations or loyalties that can, what can we do together to agree to be grateful for all that is given us? So with that, what I'd like you to do is just take a few moments with maybe two or three people who are sitting around you 
and introduce yourself and also share a moment of gratitude. So what are you grateful for this evening? And it can be anything, something from the natural world, some the lunch that Tanya provided today. Um, it could be a, a loved one or it could be love in general. Anything you're grateful for, just take a couple moments to share. Okay, one more minute. Make sure everybody gets a chance to share. Okay, if you could finish up your last thoughts. Who would like to share just anything that you heard in your group or things that you're particularly grateful for today that you'd like to share out with folks? Anything. Yes. Woohoo! Eastern Oregon University. Yes. Hmm. Absolutely. We never do anything by ourselves, right? Yep. Great. Okay. Something else, another gratitude. We've got gratitude for this place. We've got gratitude for people. Yeah. Oh. Amazing, beautiful weather. Oh, yes. And being able to be outside in weather and not bundled up and not covering over the, from the rain. Yeah, uh, if it's like this all the time, um, Eastern Oregon University! <laughs> Woo! It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful here. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, doesn't it feel different? Just feels different when we come from a place of gratitude. Um, it, we, we can probably feel a little bit of that, maybe a little less stress, maybe a little bit more positive feelings. Um, I encourage you all um, to continue this practice of gratitude. And I'm so grateful to be here. Um, grateful to be back um, with this beautiful community. Grateful to be with my colleague and friend, Francisco. Grateful to meet all of you and to be in process of doing this great work together. So thank you all so much. And I'm also very grateful for Tanya and Kristen and Rayette, who always make our trips here just so um, full with love and we're just so taken care of and we feel so happy to be here. So thank you. And the whole EOU team um, bringing us here is not an easy thing and it wasn't too terribly easy for us. I don't know if you heard, but we missed our flight. They canceled our flight. So we jumped in a car and drove from Bellingham, Washington to La Grande last night. We, and it was wonderful. It was actually really great. <laughs> it was a good, it was, it was really good. So coming back to, we, we've been here three times now. This is our third time. And um, each time has been fantastic. And the last time we were here, uh, Francisco and I um, shared some really great research around 
honoring multicultural education as a human right, and then also a more than human right. So we focused on being like a berry or cultivating hope in multicultural education through relationships, through restoration, through responsibility, renewal, and reciprocity. So tonight um, and tomorrow, for those of you who have a chance to stay with us again tomorrow, we're extending our understandings to include tribal sovereignty, land-based pedagogy, and indigenous futurities. So let's start with the EOU land acknowledgement. This is on your website. And how many of you have heard this um, at different opportunities on campus? OK, a couple of you. Yep. Wonderful. Is there someone who could read this out loud for us? I know we have a microphone over there somewhere. Just some you know, wonderful volunteer. Okay. Great, thank you. <clears throat> We humbly acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land Eastern Oregon University is upon, the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nez Perce people. We celebrate their traditions, language, and stories. We acknowledge their continuing connection, connection to this land, water, and community, and pay our respects to these original stewards of New Northeastern University, Northeastern Oregon. Great. Yes. It's like, this is EOU. We got it. We got it. Thank you, thank you so much for reading that. Um, you're the theater person too, right? Way to go. Good, good voice. Uh, yeah, no, the, you, you caught it, it was great, thank you. So what I'd like you to do is just to take a few moments, maybe back with your gratitude group of people, and consider the ways that you and or the university acknowledges, celebrates, and respects the original inhabitants of the land. And that would be the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indians. And that would include the Cayuse, the Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nez Perce, or Nimipu. So take a couple minutes to talk with each other about that. One more minute. OK, we could bring our minds together. Awesome. OK. Um, I highlighted a couple of the, the action words that were in here. Um, can, you, can anyone share with me ways that the university has acknowledged? OK, let's start with celebrate. How does the university, or how have you seen the ways that you have, or the university, celebrate the traditions, languages, and stories of the Confederated Tribes? Anything you've seen? Yeah. OK. The, the powwow, and the powwow's coming up, right? Are any of you involved in organizing the powwow? That's a lot of work. We just put on a powwow two weekends ago, so it's, we're, we, I, I know it. Um, how many of you have gone to the powwow here on campus? Great. How many of you are planning to go to the powwow this time? Keep raising your hands. Go, 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 support your native students. Um, great, yes, that is one way. What else? Yeah. 
We've had a lot of guest speakers come to the university and share their traditions and stories. Great, great. Um, bringing folks to campus, wonderful. What else? Um, I remember that when I first came here in 2017 as um, a transfer student from the islands, um, they, they, during the orientation, they took us out and their student to like the Joseph E. Place and then also some of the museum in Umatilla. Ooh. So that's, I think that's one part of it. Great. That's wonderful. Okay, so you, you got out of this place and on to community. Great. That's wonderful. Um, what are some ways that um, the university acknowledges um, the continuing connection to this land, water, and community um, with the Confederated Tribes. Yes. We talked about how some of the campus names are named after Native Americans. Like our dorm hall is called Allocate and it's after a Native American. Great. And they have like a plaque in the, their story there too. Great. Okay. Continued connection to the land, right? Is the people great? What about water um, or community? Anything else acknowledging that on campus or personally? We'll just hold that for a little bit, um, and that can come back into conversation as we continue to look at this acknowledgement. What about paying our respects for these people? the original peoples. Anything you want to add? Some of the things that you already talked about, which is naming a, a hall after an indigenous person. Um, yes. Great, okay. Great, a plaque, and I think this might be the plaque that was talked about earlier today. Great. Definitely paying respects to the original peoples. Anything else? All right, that all sounds great. Okay, let's keep going. Um, I wanna share with you that land acknowledgements are, um, they've been going on for years and years and years, mostly in Canada. Um, as land or territory acknowledgements, but they've definitely picked up in the US. And there's been concerns about doing land um, acknowledgements or territory acknowledgements. And some of it has been, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those, but I think most of the concern is that these acknowledgements are happening generally in academic spaces, like universities, or for hockey games if you're in Canada. Anyone hockey lovers in here? Woo, hockey, go Blues. All right. <laughs> yes? Woo! Oh my gosh. Okay, we're going to talk. We're in the playoffs. Stanley Cup. Okay. Um, so... Back to land acknowledgements. I got, I got sidetracked with hockey there for a minute. So Eve Tuck is one of our um, most prolific and popular scholars around indigenous issues right now. She's incredible, does a lot. You'll see Eve Tuck all over this PowerPoint. So, and also one of our largest um, educational um, you know, conferences and associations is the American Educational Research Association. And it was in Toronto in March, just, just a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago. And um, during that time, Eve Tuck and other indigenous folks in that area were asked to do a land acknowledgement. So I won't share with you the entire land acknowledgement, but I think this is really an important part where she says, actually, could somebody else read this? This is just someone Another theater person or a hockey lover. Somebody, great, a great student. You don't have to be a hockey lover. <laughs> this is not a land acknowledgement, but instead a call to acknowledge land and water and what it means to be in right and respectful relationship with indigenous people. We are committed to pushing the practice of land and water acknowledgements beyond static scripts towards more meaningful commitments, expressions of relationships, reciprocity and responsibility to land and water. Great, thank you. Um, the, this is very important. 
um, we're finding that often land acknowledgements are said, but there's very little action associated with it. So it becomes another statement. So some of the, um, some folks have come up with some, um, some things to consider. Oh, before I go further, I just wanna show this beautiful piece of artwork that you see. That is Sage, and Charlie is the artist of that. So I'm gonna get that on camera. My son, the artist. <laughs> okay, so this is, so land, um, water, place, space, territory acknowledgements um, are, should be in recognition of the peoples and the protocols of the ancestral lands and territories of those original people. So one of the questions is, um, what kind of process went into place in creating the EOU um, land acknowledgement? Was it worked on with the indigenous peoples of this area, or were they consulted in any way, shape, or form? Also, recognition that we are guests um, and also neighbors here. So for those of us, any of us, who are not indigenous to this land, we are settlers, um, we are visitors, we are neighbors. And so what does it mean for us if we are visiting here? If you, uh, you know, and we all have different protocol for when folks come over to our house, like if I know you, um, if, you know, Tanya came over to my house, I'd be really offended if she didn't go into my refrigerator and, you know, get something to drink or help herself. Um, but in general, folks that I don't know very well, I'd be kind of surprised if they came to my house and just walked in the door and started taking things or, you know, flipping the channel, changing it when the blues are on, you know, like that would be super offensive. So again, what does it look like for us to be guests and neighbors? Also, um, most of the time in land acknowledgements, there's very little about the uneasy and unspoken history of settler colonialism and the impact on indigenous communities, particularly those associated with the land that we're on. So again, I want us to think about how do we all know about the peoples who were originally here and also their histories and their histories with treaties and the histories with the, the US government. And then um, some things for us to consider as we're wrestling with these land acknowledgements is that um, what is our responsibility to the peoples whose lands we're acknowledging? What is that reciprocal relationship? Um, we are on their ancestral land. How are we giving back to that community? Um, what is our responsibility for learning the, the untold history? And then taking in consideration that in, um, that in Oregon and in Washington State, where we're from, there is a low high school graduation rate for Native students and a very low rate of Native students going to college and even a lower number of those that go to college that graduate and graduate within um, a time frame that is time to degree. Also, we know that there is biased curriculum. And I witnessed this quite a bit in doing a lot of the curriculum and tribal sovereignty work in Washington State um, with teachers who have limited access and knowledge about the local indigenous people. And then when asked to teach about um, folks, they, they don't have the um, capacity to be able to do that in a good way. So we have these biased curriculum. For those of you who are coming tomorrow, we're going to be looking at curriculum, and we're going to have an, a, an, an analysis tool that you can use, which would be really exciting. So for those of you who aren't coming, make sure you find somebody who is coming and get all the resources. Um, also, um, we need to understand the resource extraction from those lands and, our, um, and the limited resources that schools that have high numbers of Native students have access to. And then finally, we have some of the, you know, the struggles that um, many folks of color experience or is the racial micro and macro aggressions. And so again, what is our responsibility as multicultural educators? Um, and I love this last quote because I don't want this, this is, a, this is the final um, paragraph of the land acknowledgement that um, Eve Tuck shared, and I think it's really important for us. So could someone read that? Who's, who's holding the microphone? 
Rayette, would you do it? Great. I urge all guests to pay attention to this beautiful land on which the gathering is taking place. Please make an effort to notice the waters, land, air, and animals around you, and to seek out knowledge about the history and ongoing experiences of indigenous peoples here. We encourage the exchange of teachings and learnings and the co-creation of relationships that will happen during the conference. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Now, there are also folks who are saying no territory acknowledgments or no land acknowledgments. So this is, it's a, um, a Canadian broadcasting um, podcast with Hayden King, who's a professor at um, Ryerson University. And he talks about why he regrets writing the land acknowledgement for his university. And he talks about um, the, that it had to be done quickly because it was what was expected, and he felt that, it, that people really need to have a framework for writing land acknowledgments and that they need to write them in community. He also felt like we have certain obligations to indigenous communities and we have obligations to the treaties that these communities are um, in within the United States. He also talked about challenging superficiality. In these privileged academic spaces, sometimes we have, a, we have a good talk, but we don't always walk the walk. So how can we, if we are going to make a statement, how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? And maybe that looks like recruiting, and, uh, recruiting um, Native faculty and staff or supporting the Native students that are already on the campus. And also these, um, these land acknowledgements need to be accurate. So sometimes they're, they have false information or maybe they identify communities or they don't necessarily identify the broad range of communities that were originally in a particular territory. And that each of these land acknowledgements should end with a question. And um, that is a, a powerful piece, too, because our students at Western Washington University wrote a land acknowledgement that they wanted our president to share and our administrators. And it had all those beautiful components in them. And unfortunately, um, it didn't get taken up. One of the reasons was it was suggested it was too long. Um, but there was beautiful questions at the end of that land acknowledgement that we're going to come back to here in a moment. But for those of you who are like, okay, well, where would I get a, kind of a framework on how to do a land acknowledgement? So there, actually the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture has a, um, a beautiful PDF on why introduce the practice of land acknowledgement. So we're going to look at this again a little bit later. But again, a gen in general, a land acknowledgement offers respect and recognition to the indigenous community. But it also should counter the doctrine of discovery. How many of you have read about that in history or know about the doctrine of discovery? Great. Is there anyone who's willing to share a little bit about that? Just, you don't have to be perfect. Just anything you know about the doctrine of discovery. I saw little hands. You all know Christopher Columbus? Yeah. Um, he was the doctor of the doctrine of discovery. Um, so the doctrine of discovery is really a very old document that basically says um, we, in, in what, way back in the day, and so those of you who might know the history way better than me, please jump in and help me out here. But way back in the day, in the 1400s, um, the doctrine of discovery was used, um, not just by the government, but by the church, to say that we have the right to take particular lands, especially if we're going to convert folks to Christianity. It is our God-given right to access these lands. And then later, in the United States, when we started to have... Um, the U.S. talk about treaties and, and negotiations with Native folks. I think it was 1823 is the first mention of the doctrine of discovery in negotiations with taking lands from Native peoples, particularly the Cherokee, who were removed through the Trail of Tears. So we need to know more about the truth and the true story of the doctrine of discovery um, and how that impacts the people who are already here. Also, we need to have um, broader public awareness 
of the history that's led to this moment. So in this moment that we're having a land acknowledgement, what brought us here? And how are we, how are we involved with the history and what folks from this, the communities that are here want us to know about who they are? Um, so again, supporting larger truth-telling and reconciliation efforts, um, and also understanding that colonization is an ongoing process. It didn't stop. It's still happening. Um, there is no end to colonization. Um, and that the lands that we are on um, are, are occupied lands. So we, had a, um, we hired our first tribal liaison at Western Washington University in January. Woo! Big accomplishment for us. It was incredible. And one of our tribal leaders from Lummi Nation um, just wanted to make sure to remind the president and the board of trustees that Lummi Nation, um, based on a, a um, I, I can't remember the title of it, but it's part of the Lummi Nation versus United States um, 110, that said that Lummi Nation never accepted funding for the territories around Bellingham. And so this wonderful elder said, um, you all are on my homeland and you are occupying that, you're welcome. So those are the kinds of histories that we need to know and understand as well. Okay, so also taking a cue from indigenous protocol, how would the native folks in the, this region like us to enact or open spaces and how can we do that with their approval um, in reverence and respect? And then finally, the biggest piece for me is how do we inspire ongoing actions and relationships? So again, this um, US Department of Arts and Culture says that acknowledgement by itself is just a small gesture. It becomes meaningful when it's coupled with authentic relationships and informed action. But this beginning can be an opening to greater public consciousness about native sovereignty and cultural rights, a step toward equitable relationships and reconciliation. These are huge, especially in the field of multicultural education. Okay. Um, I wanted to share with you just quickly an example of a, of a land acknowledgement that we feel, and I say Francisco and I really appreciate this particular land acknowledgement, and I think lots of others do too. So most land acknowledgements are very short, um, and they're uh, you know, one-dimensional. This land acknowledgement is great. They have just your you know, provisional land acknowledgement right here. But it also says um, that, and so this it tells you what to use this for. It's intended to be read at the beginning of a formal event or on published materials. Ooh, thanks. Ooh, look at that. Whoa, nice. Um, and then it says that land acknowledgments are a responsibility. So then we begin to understand why we have this and what is our responsibility to these peoples. And then actually what is a land acknowledgement, which is fabulous, and then an extended land acknowledgement. So this is where places like Western, while we're struggling with our, our institution doesn't want to have a long one, um, but often what goes out the door when you have a longer land acknowledgement, action, acknowledgement of the histories, those kinds of things. So it becomes a little bit more superficial. But here's an opportunity to have an extended land acknowledgement, which is fantastic. And then finally, if you are a faculty, staff, or student who wants to have um, an email signature with the land acknowledgement, you can have that at the bottom of your email, which is great. Okay, so here is an example of a really well done acknowledgement. Stay with me. I know it's late. OK. So let's go back to your land acknowledgment. Dun, dun, dun. OK. So we have been, we've seen you know, some suggestions. Oops. Let's make this pretty again. Um, we've seen some suggestions. And based on the information provided to you so far, what are some of your informed thoughts on the EOU land acknowledgement. What are the strengths of this? And what would you like to see? So let's take two or three minutes in that same small group to talk about that.
Okay, we're going to hold those thoughts for just a second because I want you to keep going a little further with this. But I want to share with you that um, there's some key concepts for us in understanding um, this intersection between multicultural-led tribal sovereignty and local land-based pedagogy. So issues like understanding what colonialism is or colonization, and that there's different kinds of colonization. There's um, external colonization, and there's also settler colonialism. So external is when folks came to, when folks go to a place, extract those resources, take them, send them back home, and then leave. Whereas in settler colonialism, which is what happened in the United States, is that um, people, outsiders come to a particular land that is already inhabited by indigenous peoples, and then they claim this as their new home. And then um, the goal then is the intention of settlers has been to um, disappear the indigenous peoples from the man land and make it available to themselves. So that is, there are several characteristics of settler colonialism um, that I would really encourage you to look at. And these are very similar to issues around um, critical race theory about how race um, is just um, so prevalent that we, we don't generally even see it. And this is the same for settler colonialism. I wanted to share a couple photos um, in between when we're, we're chatting is um, I wanted to share some of the work that's being done that we're working to encourage um, students to develop consciousness around these issues. And one is we're working on a healing garden. So this is Raquel. And I did ask all the folks in the photos, I have permission. Um, this is Raquel who is, we're planting indigenous plants right now and some medicinal herbs for our healing garden. This is Gray. Gray is also part of this process of the healing garden. And so part of this also is, um, and Gray is indigenous and grew up in an urban native um, um, area. Um, so we need to ground this work in indigenous futurities. So you might be asking yourself, okay, what is an indigenous futurity? A futurity is basically the ways that groups imagine and produce knowledge about the future. So it's the living past and yet to come simultaneously. So how do we work towards futurity for indigenous peoples? So one is to re-examine um, our goals of multicultural ed. Another is to explore and engage with our own settler colonial truths. Another is understanding what indigenous futurities look like and then working patiently toward reconciliation. And this goes back to Francisco's conversation today about um, what, was, what was the um, waiting Waiting while white. So this notion that it might take a long time and being a good listener means that maybe we just have to have the patience um, to understand these concepts before we move straight to reconciliation. And reconciliation is, you know, the healing part. But I think a lot of folks, especially indigenous folks, are feeling like, ooh, can we just deal with the truth for a little bit? And then we can get to reconciliation. Okay. So um, there's been some issues that Native folks, particularly um, myself and a couple colleagues, who have been looking at research on multicultural ed and seeing where are their intersections with multicultural ed and understanding tribal sovereignty and where are some of the disconnects. And some of the um, disconnects are around the use of the term democracy in multicultural ed definitions and then the field without really um, um, honoring sovereignty. There's also reference to, there's very little reference to land and water and the use of land and water in place um, of indigenous peoples and in communities. Um, there's also been discussions about academic success that often exclude indigenous ways of knowing and being that are particular to place. And then finally, sometimes when we have a focus on race or other identities, we forget that indigenous peoples are not, yes, indigenous peoples are a racial category, as we, in fact, we know that race is a social construct. But we're a racialized people, but we're also people who have a political identity in terms of tribal sovereignty within the United States. Um, so what do we mean by land-based pedagogy. And this is different than place-based pedagogy. So place-based pedagogy is, is grounded in Western philosophy. So you know the Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. And for indigenous folks in general, it's we are, therefore I am. And so in terms of 
land-based pedagogy rather than place-based pedagogy, place-based paradigms say, well, if I think therefore I am, then I am, therefore place is. So for indigenous folks, it's um, we are, therefore I am. And so therefore in land-based is the land is, and therefore we are. Isn't that beautiful? Great. Okay. So I wanted to share this photo too of some of, um, and that indigenous futurities are for everyone. So in, if you support indigenous futurity, um, you are supporting yourself. Um, when we support, when we don't support indigenous futurities, we're also, um, we're, we're erasing indigenous peoples. We're, we're, we're accepting settler futurity. And the way that I like to connect that to multicultural education is that, you know, what's the opposite of multicultural education? Monocultural education, right? I don't think any of us would support a monocultural education. So the same thing is if we don't, um, if we're not working towards indigenous futurities, that is that the living past now and future of native peoples, um, then if we're not supporting that, we're supporting settler colonialism. So something for us to wrestle with. So these two beautiful people, um, we are doing tribal sovereignty curriculum and we're developing poster presentations. And we went out to Lummi Nation School and shared this with fifth and sixth graders. So this was the, and you, you can't see this one very well, but this one is about your area. This is about the Walla Walla um, specifically and um, talking about um, ways that, that these students could share their um, growing knowledge about indigenous issues. So finally, as we come to a close here today, I hope that you are ready to continue to have discussions about inspiring ongoing actions and relationships. So I know that um, uh, we, you know, we've talked a little bit about these different, you know, knowing your local land, like how do we know about the Treaty of 1855 in this area, addressing um, Oregon's Indian education laws and data on Native students, um, repairing relationship with local communities, and larger truth-telling, but also it is invested in leadership. And we just have a few minutes left, but I do want to share with you that, you um, this work can't be done without administration and without folks who are leading this in ways that support those of us who are either faculty or staff or students. And I just wanted to um, ask Francisco if he would share just a little bit about the process of how we even came to get to a place where we could talk about these issues with our students. As you can see, what a pleasure, and I'm so grateful for a great colleague um, to be able to work with, and um, Kristen's just an inspiration. Um, one of the things that I was talking about earlier today with uh, faculty and staff, uh, mostly, was um, that um, all of us need to develop an equity-conscious lens to the work that we're engaged in. And when I think about the work that um, Kristen and her colleagues and students are doing around this, um, it makes me realize that, you know, that it can't be just this by itself. It has to be situated in a broader um, set of projects around social justice and equity that, um, that, you hope, that I, we hope that as you get into a particular school in a school district, that it's not gonna be like, well, let's do this one thing and that's gonna be enough, but rather it has to be part and parcel of a variety of um, activities and actions that really become part of what Tuck and Yang describe as a bigger social justice project. Um, you know, I think for me, one of the things that I have to do, um, or one of the things that I do, is I come to this work as a learner. I love sitting here and just listening. I'm learning so much. And so, you know, it's that idea of, um, you know, waiting while you're white, that when you don't know this work, you have to allow the people who do have the expertise, who have the knowledge, who have the passion, who have the commitment, so let them lead you and let them take you where they tell you that you need to go and be willing to be humble enough and gracious enough to um, kind of follow that path, those pathways that they're suggesting. Um, it also means, you know, recognizing that, you know, it's unfair to ask one person to carry the burden for this. Like, well, you do the work, and then you tell me what I need to do next. Um, 
it's better when we can, you know, and we think about creating movements when, when we're not doing things as individuals, but we're doing things as part of uh, collaborative, collective uh, projects with a variety of other people and a variety of other organizations. And really, anybody who has a, who has a, um, a say or anybody who has a, a stake and what occurs, which means all of us have to be engaged in that work. And we have to allow and support the people and the individuals who are doing the work. So it's not just saying, yeah, well, I'll wait till you're, you know, I'm not, I'm gonna wait until you can tell me how I can best enter, but how can I support you? How can I be there for you um, while you're doing this really important work? Um, and finally, I think it just is um, allowing yourself to be surprised at what can be. I mean, I, I was mentioning today, as uh, some of you were in the luncheon, that you know I'm in my 41st year of teaching as a beginning teacher. Um, and that is because I continue to see myself as really open to all kinds of new possibilities and new kinds of ways of doing things and, and new ways of being as a teacher and as a human being myself. And so because I have such great admiration and respect, because the work is so important because people's lives are on the very are on the line here. I mean, we're not talking about abstract things. We're talking about people's futures, and as you mentioned, the future of the nations. Um, you know, the stakes are really high, and I have to come into this work both grateful and also gracious, and also in a good way with a good heart. Thank you, Francisco. Um, am I just the luckiest ever in the world to get to work with such a great colleague? So Francisco Rios was uh, my dean as well as my colleague. And so having a dean who um, I remember coming in several times to his office crying. Um, and I think this particular time, yes. You know, it's like, oh, here, she's coming, get the tissues. So I remember being so frustrated and being so disheartened um, with teacher education and what we were teaching um, our teachers to teach, and particularly around indigenous issues. Um, and we were struggling at that time um, to support our Native students. And I went to Francisco and I shared all of this with him. And, you know, he said, hey, well, there's got to be a way for us to vision this differently. And so he was able to orchestrate a two-year special assignment for me to start to develop what it looks like for us to honor our tribal sovereignty laws in Washington State, similar to what you have now since 2018 or 17, you have tribal sovereignty laws as educators, K-12 teachers. And so giving some time and space for me to be able to do that work um, and to build the communities, and that Francisco was not only willing to um, allocate time for that, but it was also about building relationships within community. Um, and uh, he hosted the first and only higher education summit for all of the teacher ed colleges in Washington state. And so we housed that first event and that led to several um, universities collaborating and creating coursework and different ways to make sure that we had tribal sovereignty and the tribal sovereignty curriculum that all teacher um, teachers and teacher candidates would have access to that. So that's huge. So thank you, Francisco Rios, for your vision. Thank you, Francisco. Woo. Okay. Um, I'm on, I want a new clock that says Indian time. So we've got West, West Legrand, East Legrand, or maybe it could just be Kristen time. Great. Okay. So this final slide um, is, again, your Eastern Oregon University land acknowledgement. And as you leave today, I want you to be thinking about this um, on another level. For those of you who are going into teacher education, it is by law your responsibility to know and teach about tribal sovereignty in Oregon and to support Native students in your schools and to be in community with your local indigenous nations. So I'd like you to reflect, finally, this last reflection, on one way that you've benefited from occupying this land, whether you're from Eastern Oregon or different places um, in, in Oregon or around the country. Um, and then I want you to take another minute to imagine in detail how you might or we might inspire ongoing actions and relationships um, with, those con with consciousness actions in our everyday lives to promote indigenous futurities. 
Um, and then what can you do immediately? So Francisco is always great about reminding me, what can folks take back on Monday with them when they go right back into the classroom? So what can you do immediately? And what can you work with others um, toward um, together as community um, in, in honor of these land acknowledgments that especially EOU's land acknowledgement? And with that, I will say thank you for giving me a couple extra minutes. And thank you for having us here today. Um, and thank you so much again for being a part of doing this good work and doing this good work in community. So thank you. Thank you.